Um, thank you. It's great to be here. And um, before I get started with my colleague, Bill, um, I would like to really thank Kirk and his staff at NCPTT for hosting this forum. And I especially want to thank our current NCPE um, executive team for really listening to the membership and holding this type of educational forum because that's what we are. We're educators. And in my tenure as being part of NICPE, uh, this has been a long haul waiting for this to occur. So we're very, very happy that this current group has pulled this together. Um, what we're going to talk about today is a uh, relatively new uh, experience for the Boston Architectural College and myself not so much so for my colleague Bill, which you'll learn about in a little bit. But before I get too far into our presentation, those of you that have worked with or for or received funding from our State Department understand this slide. Um, we are required uh, to disclose their participation um, in uh, this project. And of course, the American flag must always be um, uh, represented at the same, if not greater, than any other logo in any presentation or collateral material, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So here's to my colleagues at the State Department. Thank you very much. Um, I imagine that most of you are like me. Um, going back about just about a year ago, what I knew about Pakistan was what I saw on CNN read in the New York Times, saw on PBS, or the network news. I now know a lot more. But I thought I would start the presentation by um, sharing with you what Anatol Levin recently wrote about Pakistan. Pakistan is divided, disorganized, economically backward, corrupt, violent, unjust, often savagely oppressive towards the poor and women and home to extremely dangerous forms of extremism and terrorism. And yet it moves, and in many ways surprisingly tough and resilient as a state and so society. It is also quite, not quite as unequal as it looks from the outside. Now this sounds like the perfect place to develop a historic preservation program, don't you agree? However, Anatole is not correct when it comes to access um, to education, and particularly historic preservation education. Uh, we believe, based on current research, um, that we are the only initiative in the country uh, at the current time to try and develop a historic preservation program. How did this get started? Uh, last fall, uh, we received an award from the United States um, State Department to help a mirror institution in Pakistan develop a historic preservation curriculum. This, of course, was launched in Boston. This is not Pakistan. Now, let me tell you a little bit about the partners. Serendipitously, the BAC, which is Boston Architectural College, and NCA, which is the National College of Arts, Rawalpindi, have strikingly similar histories the schools are located in urban settings. Both were founded in the last quarter of the 19th century to provide skills training as opposed to academic education. The BAC was formed in 1889 as the Boston Architectural Club, whose gentlemen members provided enhanced skills training to draftsmen employed in their offices. The Mayo School of Art was established by the British in 1875 to perpetuate indigenous crafts and trades of the Punjab region in Pakistan, not Pakistan then, plus support the needs of the Lahore Museum. John Lockwood Kipling, famous illustrator and father of Rudyard Kipling, was appointed the curator of the museum and principal of the school. Over the decades, both schools evolved into accredited degree-granting institutions. Mayo School of Art was restructured in 1958 by the government of Pakistan as the National College of Arts. Ironically, the first principal charged with developing the new curricula was American and one of the original monuments men of World War II fame. Mark Ritter Sponenberg 
transformed the former training school into a contemporary college of design, architecture, and fine art. In 2005, National College of Arts opened the Rawalpindi campus to provide more geographic access to Pakistanis seeking formal design education. Boston Architectural Club became the Boston Architectural Center in 1944 to provide architecture education predominantly in the evening for those students needing to work during the day. By 2006, Boston Architectural College had evolved into four schools of design and related disciplines, offering baccalaureate and graduate degrees in architecture, landscape architecture, interior architecture, and design studies. BAC and NCA also share several common pedagogical philosophies and approaches to learning. First, all baccalaureate students are required to take the same foundation year of study, regardless of their chosen program of study. Second, experiential learning and community engagement involvement are woven throughout the respective curricula. Third, the majority of the faculty maintains academic and practicing professional credentials. These common attributes result in graduates well prepared for careers in design and related fields in our respect respective countries. If you look at the urban context today of these schools and how they've evolved, here's the image of NCA Rao Pindi's uh, modernist building set in an urban context of Rao Pindi, the ancient city, which had the modern city created from scratch in the 1960s, which is now the national capital of Islamabad. The BAC, of course, has had its um, uh, additional um, architecture added to the portfolio in this brutalist building um, in uh, a very metropolitan setting of current day Boston. Here are just some images of how similar the schools are at the outset. Studio work. I dare you to tell me whether these are NCA or BAC students or both. I think students are students no matter where you are. Now we have um, an excellent opportunity to work with our mirror institution. However, there are some caveats to this work. Uh, we have two other interested parties which have a lot to do with how we conduct ourselves and what deliverables we produce. On the Pakistani side, we have the Higher Education Commission. And you can see us sitting around a table in a high-level high meeting with them our first trip last fall, learning about how much they're looking forward to developing STEM curricula and putting most of the resources of Pakistan's government in education towards STEM not much to do with historic preservation. And then we have, of course, our own Department of State. Here's an image from the US Embassy in Islamabad, public affairs section, and what's wrong with this picture? Here we have Bill and myself in trying to be appropriate, dressing in native garb, and all the uh, Islamabad embassy personnel are dressed in Western garb. So, but what to do? So here are the major objectives of this relationship. Number one is curriculum development. Number two is distance learning. Uh, the Pakistanis need to reach more students in their country which don't have access now. And they're very backward when it comes to any type of distance learning, pedagogy, or curriculum. Collaborative research. Faculty development, this is critical. Uh, the faculty at um, NCA, again, are practicing professionals and not educators necessarily. Faculty and student exchange. We're expecting the first cohort of Pakistani students and faculty to arrive in Boston this fall. And we'll be taking our first cohort of um, BAC students to Pakistan in the spring semester. And this will continue for semesters to come. Cultural exchange. And objective seven, this is the one that I'm most interested in because the State Department has been very generous with their seed funding uh, for this opportunity, but they're expecting that this partnership continues um, forever, basically. 
So here are some of the strategies that we have identified that will help the partnership continue into the future. And now I'm going to turn um, the mic over to my colleague, Bill Remsen, who's going to talk about one of the really interesting projects that we've already got underway uh, with our colleagues. Thank you, Bob. I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about the field school, which was the first uh, bullet point on the previous image. This, this is not your typical conservation project. This is a, this is a tool. This is a mechanism to learn about conservation and the associated design issues. So the uh, Sirdar Sujan Singh Palace was built in Rawalpindi in the late 19th century for a very wealthy and influential Sikh merchant family. 27, remo room, rem excuse me, 27 rooms remain of what was much, uh, a much larger structure and estate. Currently, in this image, the right-hand side has survived, but the entire left-hand side of the image has been encroached upon by the, uh, the local um, squatter housing. The, the palace was built of fired brick, primarily, with additional parts in stone, wood, uh, and iron. It was very richly furnished, and there were fine decorated finishes, including painted plaster, stained glass, and painted and gilded carved wood. When India was partitioned in 1947, the palace was abandoned as the Sikhs fled to India. The government of Pakistan took over administration of the palace and allowed Muslim refugees coming into India to live there. At one point, there were more than 50 individual families living in the palace. You can imagine what that did to it. The palace was uh, eventually emptied when it was deeded over to the Fatma Jinnah Women's University, who still owns it, and in, two, in, two th in, in 2013, a memorandum of understanding was signed allowing the, our partnership to establish a field school there. Many of the former refugee families still work as craftsmen and live in the surrounding neighborhood. These are a couple of images of uh, posters and brochures that were created during the initial part of our work where we did a structural and health and safety assessment. We wanted to reach out to the community to make sure that we were managing expectations and fears and to, to, to make sure they understood what we were trying to do. We also, these were printed up in English and in Urdu, handed out at the site and also put on the internet. This is one of our BAC colleagues, Sharon Matthews, uh, being surrounded by uh, college girls uh, who just would not stop asking her questions. They were much too shy to talk to Bob or me, but boy, did they talk to her. It's just, it's just wonderful. Anyway, Rawalpindi, ah, talk about challenges. Talk about historic preservation challenges. Now, we've all seen, you know, we've all complained about the the classic kinds of problems we might have here in, in America, but in Rawalpindi, you've got two million plus people, no sewers, no storm sewers. You have tremendous electrical problems with outages every day of four or five hours. Infrastructure, nah. Trash pickup, nah. N just you name it, it's, it's a problem. Walking in towards the Haveli from the main street, the, the, the alleys are extremely narrow. You can't bring in any big equipment, no emergency or, or fire vehicles. On the right is the image of the, uh, the front of Haveli. It's still quite a charming building. Inside, we've got a lot of formerly grand rooms. They're really quite beautiful, um, but they're, they've suffered, obviously. Now, the, the field school, I just want to say a few things about the field school. As I said, it's a tool for teaching and learning about conservation and adaptive reuse and sustainable design in an urban environment. It's to be a proof of concept for a wide variety of interventions and activities. And it's also an opportunity to preserve and utilize and present traditional crafts, which are still available before they disappear. This is the courtyard of the valley. The challenges are quite daunting, but many of them can be resolved. I think also we have to be re realistic. Some challenges cannot be solved. Encroachment, I've already mentioned, There's, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But we, we can make a real difference. 
here's a view of the roof that um, this, the previous occupants sold off a lot of the metal roofing and drain pipe, which um, you can imagine what that does for the conservation. The brick details are exquisite, just waiting to be, to be cleaned and, and, uh, and documented and conserved. The interiors were once extremely rich, and this is a, a, a door on the left going out onto the porch, which once had stained glass, which was painted white for privacy. And the ceilings were, were very often this type of uh, beautiful woodwork that was polychrome at one point. There's, there's painted plasterwork and a stone fireplace, just giving examples of the types of, of details that remain just waiting, waiting to be exposed and, and conserved. There's, there's cast iron, much of which is um, in pretty good shape, actually. And in fact, the, uh, the British firm that provided this in the 19th century still exists. So we have some great opportunities for, uh, to resolve the missing pieces. This is a, an interesting room that is in a bridge that crosses over the street. It must have been sort of the front parlor. It had the highest level of decoration. And on the right is, a, is a, just a, a detail of the ceiling, which was, must have been absolutely spectacular when it was, when it was in good shape, polychrome and, and gold leaf. Anyway, the, the basic idea is that the field school will, will allow the students to examine investigate, document, and get their hands on the full range of conservation problems. Basically, every single type of typical problem that the students uh, would face in, in this part of the world is available here. And so with, with, the, uh, with the assistance of, of visiting experts and local uh, craftsmen and, and local staff, we will be able to give the students the kind of field school, the hands-on field school experience where, where they will literally be able to go from room to room doing various things. And gradually, uh, piece by piece, the, the building will, will be revived. But our goal isn't to finish it. Our goal is to make it a, a living, breathing, active site with lots and lots of activity, lots and lots of engagement with the local community. It, it's we're not looking for an end, we're looking for a process. And so we, we think of this as a great opportunity uh, for both the National College of Arts and for the BAC and their students. So the future of Pakistan and historic preservation there. Um, Pakistan and its rich cultural heritage face huge challenges. The Boston Architectural College National College of Arts partnership will help, help meet these challenges by improving education in heritage preservation and management in Pakistan. By exchanging Pakistani and US students and faculty and by combining architectural and sustainable design with preservation on practical real world problems, the design and preservation communities in both countries will benefit. With the majority of the population under 24 years of age, ultimately it will be the Pakistanis themselves who will determine the future of their country. They do seem eager to do a good job, and we want to do what we can to help them. Thank you.